Hey, hey, welcome. Thanks for showing up. Um, recently, this version of the presentation has been a lot of um, loose talking. And so I'll try to give it a semi semi uh, structure to it. So I think at first I'd like to gather a couple of your thoughts, questions about VR, AR um, that you have. Then I'll go over some of the latest news, specifically the Quest 3 that will be an upcoming headset and the um, Apple Display Pro. So actually we're going to be talking about AR a lot today because next year may be important. Um, and then I think I'm going to have a second wave of questions after talking about those headsets and we can dive into those questions and maybe also um, that'll be a good time to go into some of your more personal practices rather than more generic questions. If you have, you know, if you're like, oh, I, I make uh, 3D elephants and I want to know how to do it in VR or something like that. Uh, we've had people talk about more poetry, more fashion, different uh, niche that, that they had. So uh, to start off with, I'm curious if, um, you know, as part of the Q&A, if anybody has generic questions, and, and if there are none, we can even start uh, looking at more specific questions that I may answer now or maybe later on uh, during the conversation. So what are your questions? The floor is yours. You're the, you're the star of the show. What do you got here, artists? You got to create now. Create a question. Hi, Sam. It's Carolina. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if you might just give us a little intro about yourself and tell us what you do and what your expertise is so that maybe we can come up with some questions that would be appropriate. I'm, I'm really uninformed about AR, VR in general, so any intro would be helpful. True. Um, hmm. So I'm an artist from the architecture world. Um, and I've also done a lot of lighting design and architecture. So I'm, I'm from the architecture world, so I'm a big architecture nerd uh, in visualization and that side of things. Now, uh, after university, I moved to New York for a startup called Inside VR that specialized in architecture and VR. And they had all the equipment. So they had the VR headset, they had the AR, HoloLens, et cetera. So I, I got to have my hands on there and started uh, sculpting in the early days when the controllers were were available. So since then, I've been really, um, you know, on the professional side, getting good at uh, visualizing 3D buildings and um, having thinking about the experience of the users through the architecture and what that means, as well as uh, started sculpting the architecture by hand, which is uh, still not something that's quite done very often, but. Um, and then on the parallel artistic side, well, I was using those visualization skills to create a more speculative architecture uh, that's also hand sculpted in VR and meant to be experienced in VR. And um, I've worked with uh, Mural Festival here to help them with their VR and AR uh, side of things. In most architectural offices, I've been the VR, viz, research and development kind of person. and. Um, I guess in the early days of um, Take It Nunk, as well as Versum, I've been pretty involved in creating and I guess even collecting some 3D art that was either 3D uh, things or related to VR or kind of like spatial adjacent kind of things. Um, so yeah, I'm always a little bit research and development, VR lighting, visualization. And if you look at some of my art, it's more speculative architecture, like what does it mean to create architecture in VR and then experience architecture in VR? What should be different? What lessons from the past should we take and which one should we discard? And what, what is the, what's going to be, you know, the landscape in 10 years? Like we know what websites should feel like now, but if we remember, you know, when the internet started, even Google and um, Yahoo, Yahoo was the thing back then, you know, it was, 
such a mess if you look at all the web pages. So it's going to be the same thing for art, where right now we're in the mess part, um, and eventually all these things are going to be normalized, and it'll be like, of course, this is what being a VR artist looks like. Of course, this is what it looks like when you have a VR gallery in the metaverse. You know, this is what feels natural. So that's kind of a background for me. Um, it's a bit hard to not make it rambly because the path is rambly. And uh, hopefully that helps you in your question. Let me know if there's anything else. Uh, I should have done that by default. So let me know if there's anything else that um, you have suggestions for that is clearly missing from context. Mm -hmm. So I'll I'll continue asking a question because it seems like nobody else is asking any. Um, again, just such a newbie. Um, so how does this technology work? What what is involved? How how does it work? And what's the difference between AR VR? Yeah. So a key turning point in the evolution of VR was cell phones. Uh, you know, in the eighties. We wouldn't really have these extremely dense screens. So um, cell phones, when you have a lens and you put it at the right height through optics, you can kind of uh, fool your eyes to be somewhere else. And then the main thing that, let's say I made this cell phone into a VR headset. So it's like, great, I've solved the eyes. Now, how does it know where I'm looking at? Because it's going to have to change what it's showing you know, to make me think I'm in uh, Italy or something right now. So really, it's a it's a good screen, and then you have um, you need to figure out the position of where the person is looking at. So nowadays, it's mostly done through cameras. Uh, we call it inside out. So the camera is looking at the outside and figuring out its position. In the olden days, we had an external camera outside in that would look at the headset and be and then figure out based on these LEDs with specific light patterns where the headset was looking at because if there's light there and there and there it can triangulate and figure out the angle of the thing so basically you've got a screen you've got a triangulation of the user um, and then you know the next step is bringing in the hands usually so that's usually done through a controller and now in the apple with cameras if you have a bunch of cameras you can kind of figure out where the hands are and that's a more natural but less precise experience um, so that's kind of like how the technology works. There's a lot of sub subtle stuff with the eyes, with the optics um, that are going to be solved with times, uh, with with time. And for example, you know, well, actually, the camera's doing it right now. Like, if my face is clear, my hand in the background is blurry. So our eyes work that that way, and VR doesn't. So um, it's not going to have those different focal distances as much. And so once that's solved, we'll be able to, you know, stay eight hours in VR instead of having these weird kind of like, hmm, there's 3% wrong with this picture. Why am I, you know, reality is a little bit puzzling right now uh, type of feeling. Um, so that's mostly VR optics and how VR works and why VR, why we're able to get headsets for $500 because it's like a modified cell phone. Um, now, AR, there's different ways of doing it. So let's go over the difference between VR and AR. VR, you're in another world. I'm in Star Wars. I'm on the moon. I'm somewhere impossible. I'm in your drawing. I'm in your VR gallery. So anything can happen, but you start from an empty space, and you get to be the god creator of that space. AR, well, AR is augmented reality. and uh, it means that you start as your base with reality. So um, I can put a gorilla here, and I'm going to be here, and the room is going to be here. So what does that mean if I'm on the bus? What does that mean if I'm on a train, and I've got this much space in front of me? How am I going to watch Star Wars then? You know, What does it mean if I'm in a field, and I've got the entire field in front of me? It's a little bit like um, there's this new concept much like websites will shift and then you'll have the mobile view once you're at a certain space. So there's this new concept of saying, I don't know where the heck the viewer is going to be. It was easy in VR. I just said, you've got a two meter by two meter or let's say nine foot by nine foot square. And I don't care what your house looks like. You can't do it in the train, obviously. 
this is your square, this is where you're interacting. In AR, you don't know where the user is going to be. There's going to be people, there's going to be pets, there's going to be obstacles. Um, but you can say, you know, this is a table game. Find a table, find a flat spot, and then I will put stuff on the table and you can play chess there or whatever it is. Or you can say, place, you know, we see this a lot in art. We say, tell me where you want the art. You go, okay, I want it over here. Uh, and then it's going to put the dragon over here, you know. Um, but I think in the long term, where it's, you know, I think. Apple Display Pro, for example, has thought a lot about 2D, so putting up screens places and HoloLens and Magic Leap, which are other AR headsets, have also done that. So you can put big screens everywhere. So the idea with Apple is you open your Mac, and all of a sudden there's these three giant screens that would cost you know $3,000 each uh, otherwise, but they're also non-physical. So you have more screens you have access to, um, but somebody can... You know, you're, you may still even see the plants behind them, and nobody's going to break those screens, and they can be any size. Uh, it doesn't really quite matter because it's it's kind of like that web-siting reality, appifying matter type of uh, psychology. Um, so, so yeah, VR, you're in another space. AR is kind of like a communal hallucination, this appification of reality, if you will. Now, appification doesn't actually, maybe it's the wrong word, right? Because I think when we see good user interface through augmented reality, it's more like magic. It's more soft. It's more human. Um, and I mean, it kind of goes into this other thing about spatial web, VR, AR, that it has an extremely emotional component to it. It's more like architecture. It's more like interior design. Uh, lighting, for example, colors are, are more important. It doesn't really quite matter if you go on Amazon and Amazon is, you know, that little square of capitalistic chaos is happening. But when it's in your entire space and maybe even, you know, your friends and partners can see it. I don't think we're going to have AR glasses for dogs yet, but maybe it's coming. Uh, when your friends and partners can see you shopping on Amazon, like what does it look like to shop on Amazon if it's a spatial thing? Like let's say you're looking for boots. Are they going to show you 30 boots? They're going to show you three boots? Like where's the pop-up is going to be? So there's this, there's this new sensibility uh, where design is going to matter because it's going to be inhabited and felt in a more um, phenomenological type of way where you're, you know, you're more affected by uh, bad architecture than like a bad book design, for example. So um, there are some written questions, but I'm curious, uh, did I miss any of your questions? You asked, what's the difference and how does it work? Oh, maybe one thing about AR. So there's two ways that the, the lenses in AR are more complicated than this. Um, and that's why AR is more expensive, and that's why AR is trailing VR. And uh, there's still a lot of similarities. So if you're interested in AR and you can't afford it, learn VR first, and you'll, you'll get there once uh, the headsets are there. OK, so how do AR lenses work? Um, they're obviously, if you're talking to like a physics expert in AR, they're going to say my answer is too simple. But there's two types of lenses we see a lot. There's basically transparent lenses, like we see on the HoloLens and the uh, Magic Leap. Um, so usually it's kind of weird, complicated optics, but you have a semi-transparent lens, and then they shoot light into it. There's different ways of shooting the light into it. But basically, you end up seeing the world just like through sunglasses. And somehow this very expensive, very complicated lens allows the uh, another layer of light that wasn't, it's kind of like a transparent screen where you still see reality. So that's a kind of expensive way of doing it. Um, there's also these kind of tricks. So one of them, um, what was it? Uh, like a, before Facebook acquired Meta, there was another company called Meta that did AR headsets. Um, I think it was like Meta something else, like Meta Vision, and they had Meta Glass. Anyways, so there's this old trick called Pepper's Ghost. And Pepper's Ghost is used, it's been used in theater for like hundreds of years. 
And let me try to simulate it real quick. Um, so you basically have the, I'm gonna do a little drawing, one second. Um, okay, so here you have the person watching the theater play and they're watching the actor. In the middle, you put a transparent piece of, not glass, but let's say acrylic, that has some sort of 45 degree angle. And you can still see through this acrylic to the actor. And then there's, let's say, an illuminated image down here at this angle, or an actor down here. And they will get reprojected in the middle as an illusion. So in a headset, I think what it was is there was this basically a screen here and then a 45 degree angle here and then so you're seeing through the lens and it's also reflecting what's on the screen so that was like super cheap way of doing ar um, with the metavision headset and then what we're seeing with uh another kind of work around it where you don't need that expensive lens is to basically you do a vr headset like i showed you earlier very easy a bit of duct tape in a cell phone. Uh, no, but you do a VR headset that has you know, a screen, lenses, and positional tracking. And then you put some more cameras here close to where the eyes are, ideally. And when you do VR, you don't use the cameras. You just do regular VR. And when you do AR, you have to show the eyes what the cameras are showing. Um, and so you're not looking at the world like this. You're doing what's called pass-through, where you're looking at the world through two cameras that are looking outside. And um, that has disadvantages because, like, from a feelings point of view, my eye is over here. Now you're telling me my eye is, like, an inch or two in front of one of my real eyes. So when I do this, there's something that my brain goes, bah, 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 no, 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 this is not right. Um, your eyes are not there. <laughs> so anyways, that's how I felt. And maybe some people will not feel that way. Um, and if you really wanted to go over that limitation, one thing you could do to over-engineer it would be to say, hey, to reproject the, instead of having the eyes here when I'm calculating the camera, I'm going to recreate, I'm going to you know, do photogrammetry, recreate the world in 3D create a VR world that's exactly like the real world and then render it as if the camera was where, where the real eye position is. But obviously, if you're following me, that's like way too much overkill for like a slight comfort thing. So um, long story short, AR is trickier than VR in terms of the optics especially. Um, and what we're going to get in this first generation of AR, VR is this pass-through. So uh, Quest 3 is going to have it, meaning it's a VR headset that can do AR through the pass-through cameras that are aligned where your eyes are. And so will the um, uh, Apple's Display Pro um, headset. So they're going to have both VR and AR. But I'm very curious to see. I, I have a feeling that we're going to feel that mild discomfort of the differences of where the eyes and the cameras are. And uh, a lot of the comfort is going to be determined by that, or it's going gonna, it's gonna to bring in this new weird feeling that people have never experienced before if it's not mitigated somehow. So that is my answer to that question. Yes. What do you use to sculpt mainly these days? To be honest, in the last year, I've kind of pivoted away from VR sculpting, but I'm still looking at it, especially thinking in mind the AR aspect that we're going to see next year. So um, I'm Oculus Medium, and there was actually kind of three versions of, uh, I should say Adobe Medium. There's kind of three different versions of the software. There's the original one, which was made by Oculus called Oculus Medium. Do not download that one. It's buggy. There's the uh, Adobe Medium. So Adobe bought it. And then they said, we're going to develop it until there's no more bugs. And then we stopped development and we moved to the third version. So that one is actually free. And it's the one I use so far. Then there's the 
third version, which is the Adobe, you know, capitalized um, uh, expensive subscription. But they are adding some new features to it that are interesting. So, for example, you can work both in 2D on your screen, well, 3D on your screen, uh, which is good for if you're doing more like logical architecture. If you want to do a square in VR, it's going to be really painful to sculpt it by hand, if not impossible. Um, and then when you want to do the more organic stuff where you want to feel what it's like to be in front of your sculpture or inside your sculpture, you just put on the headset. Now, I haven't tried it. Well, I think I tried it during the, the demo early on when it was in beta, but that new paid Adobe version, um, it's like six, well, I'm talking Canadian dollars. It's like $60 Canadian per month to have access to it. And I don't need any of the other software that's in the bundle. So I was like, there's no way I'm signing up for $60 a month for that. And the, I actually just discovered last week that you can buy it standalone on Steam for like $160 or $200 as a one-time payment for the new VR app. So I was like, OK, that, that's like you know actually doable. Uh, it's like four months of the subscription, basically. So, um, but I need I need like I work full time, so I would need time to really either take my old super complicated project and see how it fares, or you know try a new like when I do a sculpture nowadays or like my last sculptures are generally like one year sculpting projects. So it's not the kind of thing I can do in a even in a one week trial. Like I work, have a little bit of life, and then I be able to put a couple hours into art. Um, so I'm kind of waiting for the right moment to go test the new version to see. And frankly, the reviews are horrendous. They're a bit terrifying. So sometimes reviews are overly harsh, especially when it comes to VR. Um, I have very, very unique and specific needs for my VR sculpting. Like it's a lot of detail. Like the last piece I did, like I said, took a year to sculpt. And I think it was. 230 million triangles at the end or something ridiculous like that. Um, and Medium never crashed on me. So I was like, you know, I have, I think, 64 or 128 gigs of RAM, which I actually got just to sculpt bigger stuff. But like the fact that Medium didn't crash on me for a whole year of abusing my computer with this ridiculous sculpture is very impressive. So, you know, I'm wondering, will the new version of Medium even handle what I'm doing? Um, I don't know. So because of the price, I stayed away from it. But now there's a, you know, $200 for a forever tool. Is, if it's a good tool, it could be worth it. So Medium from Adobe, which you'll find on the Oculus Store without a subscription, and it's free. That's the tool that I use the most. And I just use the white ball. I don't really change much from the white ball. I don't even use the colors. I do all the colors in um, um, when I do the rendering or the light baking through Octane after. And it's usually just solar lighting. Um, or actually, in the second last piece that I did, the architecture was white, and I just tweaked the sculpture so that it was green. And that was like the only color choices I made with very matte materials. So that's the tool that I use for my VR sculptures. Uh, okay, so next question is this curiosity about AR and wanting to use VR sculpting, painting software to create AR. So yeah, anything 2D or 3D you can put in AR. So if you're interested in creating AR, VR, well, start with the hardware in mind. Uh, you may want to see the last talk I did about AR and why it's super complicated right now, especially if we're thinking about like through your cell phone with a subscription model of some sort of hosting. So, um, so well, let's talk about AR. So Apple announced that Maybe we should talk about the new Apple headset real quick. So the new Apple headset is big. Um, a lot of people still haven't heard about it, surprisingly. But when we talk about HoloLens, when we talk about Magic Leap, even though it's Microsoft, um, 
who did the HoloLens and Magic Leap is a secondary company, nobody really knows or cares about it. Um, they've done a lot of the groundwork, but they haven't reached mass appeal or mass conscience even. And uh, Palmer Lucky, the founder of Oculus, said, you know, VR has to be something everybody wants before it can be something that everybody can have. So this idea of developing something really high end for for VR or AR is important. So Apple's introduced a headset. It's three thousand five hundred uh, thirty five hundred dollars US. So obviously, you know, none of us can afford it unless you're working for a startup that is working in AR. But the good news is that it's actually well, I haven't tried it. It's coming out early next year, but it looks. Like they haven't completely messed it up. It looks like generally some interesting choices, um, some good design that's pushing towards like, you know, what should good AR look like? They've done some good work on there. So um, it's going to be a luxury product. You can remember the MacBook Air. MacBook Air had what, like one USB port, you know, <laughs> and it was, I don't know, $3,000. And you were like, who's going to use this? And then the second generation, the third generation. Now it's like, oh, my book here is a great product. So I think we're going to go through this, where by the third or fourth or fifth generation, you're going to be like, okay, yeah, I can buy an iPad. Now I can buy a display. The other thing, too, is Apple Display Pro um, implies the existence of Apple Display not Pro. <laughs> so something more for the masses. Uh, and we've seen this in the leaks saying that I think by 2024, 2025, they want to have a more accessible uh, AR headset. And, you know, if you're talking about, like, just the ability to throw a giant screen and watch movies in high definition through AR, that's an easier thing than saying, I want to visit a space with 250 million triangles, you know. As movie is, like, not very demanding graphically versus a 3D environment where there's live lighting, things are moving, that would be very demanding for, uh, for any hardware to deal with. So um, I recommend learning Unity if you're going to be doing VR or AR. They're always at the forefront of supporting VR and AR headsets, including, well, Apple announced that the uh, Apple Display Pro would support Unity. So um, Unity is not where you create, it's where you assemble and connect things. So you're like, okay, I've got this sculpture, bloop, I've got this movie, I've got this character, I've got this script, I'm putting it all in Unity, and then I'm going to publish it to a cell phone, to a VR headset, to AR headset, to a desktop computer, to PlayStation 5, etc. You can kind of publish it everywhere. But Unity is always one of the first ones to support VR and AR equipment. Um, as well as they're probably, I mean, I'm, I'm not an Unreal guy, so uh, un basically if you do any kind of VR, AR, or game development, you're going to be using Unreal or Unity. So those are your two options, but I recommend Unity if you're going to be going into VR or AR. So um, let's say you have a scene, you know, you're like, okay, here's a floor, I'm going to put a little... VR, AR camera, have to follow some online tutorials for that, see what the latest tech is, uh, or plug in or drop in. And then you have your piece of art here, here, here. And then when you put on the headset and you click that app, you're going to be in that space with those pieces of art that you're seeing. So that's kind of, you know, if we're thinking about like AR art shows for next year, that's how I would. Uh, Envision it. I wouldn't try to make some sort of cell phone thing. I would target the VR, AR headsets that are coming. Um, another big announcement, once again related to hardware, is the Quest 3. So the Quest from Facebook slash Meta um, slash Oculus. The Quest 3, well, the Quest first off has been a very transformative headset. Let me bring it up here. It's something that you all can probably afford with some sacrifices. You know, so this is a $500 headset, um, and it's been out for, I don't know, a year or two. So it's pretty easy to find them and used. You know, people buy them at Christmas, and then they're like, ah, you know, I don't use this thing. Let me put it on 
marketplace or whatever, you know, to, to stay in the meta um, ecosystem. So, so the third version of this is coming, and they're going to be adding these pass-through cameras. So it's going to give it similar capabilities to what Apple is doing. So both the upcoming headsets are going to do VR and pass-through AR. Uh, but this headset is going to be like $500 territory, and Apple is going to be $3,500. So we all know what headset people are going to buy. It's going to be the Meta One, the Quest 3. And so if they don't mess it up, which they did last year with the Quest Pro, which was a complete failure for the AR component, but I think they know the stakes are up, and now it's good they've got the competition of Apple. So if they don't mess it up, the Quest 3 is going to be absolutely game-changing. And it could mean that next year is the year of AR art, meaning you can afford $500 with some sacrifices. Um, and so can a gallery. And then that means that if you really want to, you can find a gallery that's willing to collaborate with you and put your experience into AR. Um, you know, now, what does that mean to do an AR experience? It could mean that you want to 3D model the gallery and be ready to really have some site-specific interventions. It could mean that you put a sculpture in the gallery and you have an AR component that is additive to that sculpture. Like you could have a tree trunk and the leaves are AR. And then, you know, once something is AR or VR, it can connect to external data source. It's like... A, like, you know, when you check the weather and the icon is different based on the weather, like think about that for a uh, space for art. So you can connect to the time of the day, how many visitors are in the space, uh, the weather, what's the national sentiment, what's the local sentiment. You can connect to any kind of issue you're trying to explore and unravel for your visitors. Um, and to get back as to how is it possible to use VR sculpting and painting software to create AR. So Unity is a gatherer. So you can bring anything 3D into it, whether you sculpted it in VR, whether you did a 3D scan of it, whether you modeled it in 3D on your computer, or downloaded it off the internet. So you bring in those things, you put it in Unity, and Unity will allow you to pump it out to one of these and plug it in, create an APK file. You know, I'm not going to have to YouTube the tutorials for this, but that's basically the macro plan for, for all of this. Um, so that was my rambling answer. Reading Yvonne Kessie's Architect IRL, but Web3 spent entire time and life and energy. Played with some AR. Oh, mm, well, okay. So he's asking about you know old versions of AR. Like there's two kind of easy to implement versions of AR in your cell phone. One of them is you point to a QR code and it goes, okay, I understand where and what that is. I will put the thing on the QR code where you're pointing at. So that was like back then because we didn't have the technology to do anything otherwise the other one is i've talked about it earlier you're like i don't have a qr code but i want you to put the art here so you know we see that on hicket on on object on most uh nft platforms that support 3d that's how they work uh, when you have a 3d model and you have a cell phone it does ar automatically so um i would just recommend kind of what i've mentioned go on the headset. The cell phone is weak. It is not meant for AR. And the thing with supporting cell phone is your aunt's going to have a cell phone from 10 years ago. Uh, you know, Mr. And Mrs. Student is going to have a bad cell phone. So you you end up not making false promises, but you end up having to set a low target first off because you want to support as many cell phones as possible. And it's extremely complicated because every cell phone is different and you're going to see, you know, it may not open for somebody, maybe bad user experience, it may overheat, the battery may get eaten. Um, and there's a whole 
like we we had an experience in a park and like it was really hard to get people to go to the spot and figure out you know oh this is where i'm supposed to see it and then the thing would appear so uh, cell phone ar um it's a challenge it's a whole challenge of its own and you may end up working more on that challenge and on the art itself if you can work with a gallery that is willing to you know whether it's your own headset or theirs that is willing to work with you because then they have to kind of guide the users through it and then of course in a couple of years this will be easier because uh, people will have done the hard work of educating uh, and showing that there's a reason to do this but i would recommend buying a headset and collaborating with the gallery or you know you can have a pop-up space or you can say i'm going to go that night uh, allow me to come and, and see your audience that night or, or something like that but there's got to be a meeting point between your art in vr and the public you don't want to just want to throw it on steam throw it on twitter i mean of course if you've got a following that's great you'll get the you will get everything you need but you want to also throw it to the non-twitter people to the people who don't even know what vr and ar is you want to throw it to the public to to um to the non-nerds basically to the people who who you know need to get in contact with this and can't because of financial or uh you know they just don't know about it so that's what i would recommend is kind of the path that i've explained um obviously i mean if you can if you can uh, target the apple display pro good for you find a gallery that'll work for you because there's there's a whole market of like rich people waiting to be entertained with the apple display right they could be like i got this headset i'm ready to spend money on experiences i want to wow everybody what can i do you know it's like the ferrari headset um, and then there's the rest of us, which are going to be on the Quest uh, 3. And um, that's probably the most you know, influential bunch, obviously, because of the volume. And uh, once Christmas hits, if the marketing is good, like there should be a good reach. Like the last Christmas, because of the Quest Pro's affordabilities, the last Christmas have been, well, pretty good for VR. At the same time, you get these waves of like nine-year-olds like with really bad insults. Um, and that are really annoying the adults trying to play video games in VR. But uh, in terms of getting it spread out there, like a lot more people have access to VR now. So yeah, that's what I would recommend is play with uh, Unity and target the Quest 3 Pro, uh, Quest 3, or you can also target the Quest 2 because this will be like two years old by then. So there's going to be a lot of these floating around and this is still good hardware. But it can't do AR, it can only do VR. And as I mentioned earlier, if you're good at VR, you're going to be good at, you know, you've got 80% of what it needs to think spatially. And then you're just going to need to start thinking about the social, physical context of the users after that. Um, yeah, somebody mentioned that the Quest 2 does not support. Um, medium you need a chunky computer to do medium so uh, you'll need to tether to your computer you basically have a wire coming out of this to your computer or you can do the wireless part which uh, basically means i suggest getting a dedicated router um, you can research this online like a good dedicated router that will basically just connect this headset to your computer through a dedicated wi-fi connection and then you you can walk around with this with no wires. So if you do that and you tether to your um, desktop computer that has a good graphic card, then you can use Medium on this headset. Oh, that's really, I actually didn't realize that. So you can use like the processing of your computer with the Quest headset. Yeah, and keep in mind, it acts basically as a Rift S when you Connect it to your computer, meaning all the games that you bought for the mobile version will no longer be available. It will use the games that you have installed on your computer. Your headset basically comes a viewer for your computer at that point, including for VR. Uh, and then if you think about that for an art installation, it means like it would be a bit of a pain to support when you're not there. But it means like you can basically have like a football feel 
you know, or like a very large space with no wire and put any kind of architecture in there that people can walk through. So like when you think about uh, exhibition design, that is very exciting if you were to find that opportunity. Uh, you know, like uh, Nicole could rent a space and put a giant VR gallery that people could walk in without having to fake teleport with, with their sticks. Um, so in a much more accessible, physically accessible and comfortable way. Uh, yes, VR chat is, so VR chat is a social VR platform that people sometimes confuse with the metaverse. Um, but it is, uh, it's kind of like spatialized 4chan in a way. It's just like very internet-y and you're in it and there's a bunch of people with avatars. I've mentioned this before, like you go in there and it's like 30% men in tiny anime women's bodies. <laughs> like that's that's a that's a thing and it's like super normal. <laughs> so there's a Acclimatization, like there's an adaptation period. I don't go in there often. I think it's a it's a neat party trick for people who have never been in VR, and you put them in there, and they've heard of the metaverse, and then it's so it's so kind of surreal and awkward, and they're like, these are real people in front of me, and uh, you know, very often because it's filled with very young kids, they'll start getting bullied. <laughs> it's like. You know, it's like a very toxic forum, but with people in front of you as avatars. So um, if you've never been in VR chat, I recommend it just so you have a, an opinion on it because it's very contemporary. Um, yeah, so with that being said, I'm curious if there's any questions that popped up and perhaps there's some people that have questions closer to their own practice, especially if you have a you know, something you like to do, or, you know, I've mentioned, we've talked about poetry and VR and FTs, and we've talked about uh, fashion, but maybe there's a little bit of a niche that you're trying to connect with VR and AR, and you're not quite sure um, whether it's technical or philosophical problems for the connection. Here. Let's see some names I recognize. Okay. Um, don't see anything I haven't addressed, but um. Hmm. Is there anything else to say about the Apple Quest, the Apple uh, Display Pro? Hmm. I mean, you know, the, there's the two headsets. I think Quest 3 is coming out in October and Apple uh, early next year, although I've seen some reports that they're having some manufacturing issues. They can't get enough of those screens down, so they may have create less than they were planning. Um, but yeah, so really the real contender, like Apple is great for inflaming the imagination and opening a rich person market, uh, but the real game changer is going to be the Quest 3. So if, if they do the pass through properly, which I think they will, it'll really be, uh, I think we're going to see the birth of proper AR art next year if they don't mess it up. So if you've been thinking about AR or, or VR, um, now's the time to kind of save your money for the Quest 3. Well, read the reviews first, see if it's not a total disappointment when it comes out in October. And if the reviews are good, um, and you can find a gallery or a space or a way to show this to the public, then you can be part of you know the real wave. Because it wasn't really possible to create good AR art in mass last year. Um, sure, it's possible to do, you know, uh, 
promo videos where it looks like that's what is happening, but it's not possible to do it for real. But next year, I think we're we're going to see the 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 real flame, the real uh, spark of AR art if if they don't mess up this Quest Three headset. Is there a good way to use AR VR on Twitter other than taking videos of the work? Um. So, well, I think what's wrong with videos of the work? Like, especially with VR, right? With, I'm sorry, with AR. With VR, it's a bit tricky. Like, when I want to take videos in VR, I'm limited to the size of my living room. And uh, doing my, my VR spaces are much bigger. So, and then I have to do this kind of weird, awkward filming where walking through the space like this, trying to not hold it so it doesn't have the natural shake of my head. Um, and then having to do, you know, stabilization in, uh, in post-production after. So it's not that great, but for AR, it's actually a strength because uh, I've talked about this last time, but you're actually recontextualizing the artwork or you're curating it and beyond that like if you just put a 3d model right now on on um object.com or hake it or uh you know Taya, i guess it's ar i can open up that thing or my ipad pro and go uh you know in rome or in greece or my backyard with my cat and i can put the art next to my cat. I can put it in the Colosseum. I can put it in the Louvre. I can put it in the sewer. I can you know, simply take a trip to Mars and bring the art to Mars with me. Um, and as we move forward, that, that experience will be shared. It won't just be me through my phone. It'll be me through regular glasses and also the people around me. It'll be more of a shared hallucination. So the fact that AR you know, I can't carry that sculpture with me to Athens or in my backyard or the mall without the risk of breaking it. But I can bring my entire 3D collection in the cell phone and go wherever the heck I want and place it at the precipice, you know, where there's a three kilometer drop and not have to worry about it breaking. Um, and I can even scale it, uh, I can rotate it. I, I become the curator in the real world. I create this intersection between the artist's dream and the mundane reality, or the not so mundane reality that we have. So not, not just me, but you can go, you know, I have, uh, I think I have at least eight 3D objects on my, on my Hiknung slash Taya slash object account. So you can open those and you know put in the garbage and say, Sam, I think your art is garbage. I put it in the garbage. Or you can you know put it on a pedestal or someplace that looks like it's appropriate or holy or whatever, and recontextualize it. So the spectator now has the opportunity to um, to be a spatial curator in a completely different risk-free way. Well, risk-free. I'm sure you could hurt the concept. Um, and uh, and that's that's definitely not that's good. <laughs> like you know, when you have a painting, you're like, oh, here it is. I've cropped it. You know, here it is in this space. Here it is in this other space. But you're not going to bring the painting in the mountain or on a boat with you. Um, and you're 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 going to have to get an art handler, etc. So it's a strength. The fact, especially for AR. Um, of course, it'd be great, and you can do some composition stuff, right? You can take a, you can fake it. So you can say, I'm going to do a render of the art, and then I'm going to take a DSLR photo. I'm going to smash them together. Um, like personally, I got an iPad Pro specifically to create better videos of uh, my AR art because on here I'm going to be very limited, um, and it's slower. It's not as powerful for the 3D aspect of it. So. Um, yeah, so that's a good way to display AR art. And really, there's not a lot of that happening. Like, you could say, here is my AR piece. Um, I'm going to give a prize to whoever is able to curate the best 
you know, AR mashup with reality. So that's like a, that's a interactive aspect that is underutilized at the moment, at least from, from my observations. Um, okay, next question. How do you look at the fact that VR, AR right now need both powerful computer and expensive-ish and uncomfortable devices? I did AR project uh, on mobile, but it's problematic. Apple policy compatibility. Um, the advantage is that the viewer can, yeah, it's more accessible when you do mobile VR. So mobile VR, there's two ways, right? You can go accessible. It's going to be problematic, more work. Um, you're going to probably do 80% of the work you're going to do is stuff that you don't want to do. <laughs> That's like optimizing geometry and materials, baking lighting, uh, dealing with where you're hosting this, trying to make sure it runs on all of the weak computer, uh, weak cell phones from the last um, seven years. So uh, you may have noticed this trend that generally the more expensive the hardware, the easier it is for the art. And the least expensive the hardware, the easier it is for everybody else but the artist. So um, it depends on your amount of effort, but I started trying to make it uh, accessible to everybody. Actually, I started, what was it called? Uh, anyways, I, there was this metaverse platform that they were supporting this terrible headset back then that was literally running off a cell phone and you know, it had, I think, 100 or 150 or 50,000 triangles max. So it was all about optimizing, and you were very limited. And then at some point, uh, when I moved back to Montreal, I was like, "No, I'm never, <laughs> I'm never doing that again. Life is too short to spend most of your time optimizing. I want to do art. I want to do good art. I want to scratch the future. I want to do cutting edge art. I want the best art. And the way I found to do that." Um, was about to get a good VR computer at home. And then I actually built a secondary VR computer. Um, and I found a gallery to work with. And I even got actually two VR headsets. So one for me, one for the gallery along with the computer. And then I was like, here you go. Put that in your gallery. And I'll teach you how to show this to the public. Um, so that's how I got around it. But it allowed me to do things that nobody else was doing. So it allowed me to absolutely, um, well, I, it was my own graphic card in the gallery of the computer. So I knew it was like a 2080 or whatever it was. So it could handle 2.5 million triangles or whatever that number was. So whereas at any other gallery, they would be like, ah, sorry, our computer's not that great. You need to give us, you know, these are the priorities. Like, no, 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 no. Screw these limits. I want to touch the edges of the limit right here. And, um, and so to do that, I kind of had to provide, you know, to, 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 to find my own little alternative uh, way around it. So I know obviously that involves like thousands of dollars that most people don't have. Um, but this is, you know, or there's a will, there's a way. And I'm not, I'm not saying that one person can do this, but you can group up with other artists, get some grants. I never asked for grants, so grants would have probably helped a lot. Um, like if you have one library or one gallery or one museum that has a VR headset, well, you're opening up a dialogue with them because chances are there's not like 100 VR, AR artists in your neighborhood that are going to be able to show there. Uh, there's not that many to pick from when you're a curator. Um, and if there are, then that's great. And you can be part of that community and you can be a precursor to that community. Um, and then there's, you know, like I said earlier, you can just put a 3D object on Taya or object.com and it's AR in a way. You know, it's kind of lazy person's AR. So, um, and then you can play with that concept uh, a bit more. But yeah, I think it comes down to the more money you have, the easier it is. The more you're trying to make this accessible, um, the more
more you're going to have to work and the least you're going to be able to do. And then, you know, there's a middle point in there. Like I, I went into both extremes. There's a million gray zones in the middle. Um, and like, for example, if you don't need to develop for a, a thing that runs on a desktop, it's going to be much easier. <laughs> Uh, but you can do like this is the low end, this is the medium end, and this connected to a desktop is the higher end because the desktop may be two or three thousand dollars. Now during COVID, the price of a desktop went up by like a thousand dollars because everybody was doing the graphic cards. Now it's back. The, the, that crazy, that crazy thousand dollar bump is gone generally. So it's less of a crazy scenario than during during the crisis uh, where all the computers were extra expensive so yeah that's that's my answer regarding uh, accessibility and you'll have to find a decision i think a lot of people started very utopian and they're like i'm going to create this giant world and everybody's going to go and vr and ar and do it and then they're they're like never optimized for one of these and then they're like oh why you know why is it running at five frames per second and everybody's getting sick and I get this weird look when they take off the headset and they're like, yeah, it was great. You know, um, make sure you get 60 frames per second or more. Be aware of frames per second. That's very important. Otherwise, you're going to make people sick and they'll never want to do VR again. <laughs> so um, unfortunately, even if you're running a big computer, you need to be aware of these basic uh, optimization or performance aspects or VR because um, you know, it's one thing to have a painting with jagged edges, but if, if somebody's reality and optics are uncomfortable, then your body's going to be uncomfortable and uh, they'll associate it with the medium. Um, yeah, so, so Yinga mentioned filters on Instagram stories. So I think it's good to explore those. There's something to be done. And once again, just be future thinking. So like, let's say you're a fashion designer and you want to work with AR. Don't limit yourself to just the face. Be like, OK, imagine if within a year or two, we start integrating the body, and now I can have my whole body be a fashion thing. And you know what? I, I know this is possible through other technologies. Like if you really want to, you'll be able to do it. Or there's there's XR fashion Instagram accounts that, that do it. Um, so. You know, don't be limiting to your don't be limiting your thinking to the tools of today. Like design a full body AR suit, design a real piece of clothing that is meant to be augmented with AR around it, or like ask yourself the question: Okay, I can do AR clothing now. Why? What? What are you gonna do? Is it gonna change color and shape with the weather? Is it going to change shape with the surrounding, with the feeling of the person wearing it? Like, ah. um, or, you know, what is it going to do? Why is that good? And then obsess over that concept. Talk about it. There is a second layer. Like, we can imagine what's going to happen in five years, but what's going to happen in 500 years? Like, there's still so much to be written. This is just the, the spark at the beginning, especially, you know, we're potentially entering the the year of AR. So um, when they write about art history, they'll write about who did what at the beginning. And so you have this very one-time chance of slipping in there um, before the market gets saturated or World War III happens. So get in there. Now, now's the chance. This, these opportunities are only like what internet was, I don't know, 15 years ago, and then we got VR wave. Now the AR wave is coming, and, and maybe the sweet spot in history. Jump in there and prop your foot into the art history book and say, look at my AR. Um, OK, so that's one question. Blah, 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 blah. Mm, so the question about USDZ and Apple headset. Um, 
you know, I think there's a little bit of uh, those are wait and sees. I'm not that up to date on those. I think I've supported USDZ. Basically, I take my FBX, I open it in Blender, import FBX, and then export USDZ, and that's the end of it. Blender is free. So for me, uh, that's my process. And so far, it's worked. It looks just the same when I export it. There's a few tutorials uh, if you just look up converting FBX to USDZ, but I really don't have the um, the the the, the The specialization in that. Now, that being said, Apple said they're going to support Unity for this. So um, historically, Apple has been absolutely horrendous at any kind of 3D performance. They have beautiful computers that are weak, uh, at least for doing any kind of 3D, you know, obviously art. So there was this brutal takedown of Apple from um, Palmer Lucky, the founder of Oculus. And people were asking, when are you going to support Apple? And he wrote something like, when Apple makes a proper computer that can, I mean, most, most even like the $6,000 computer from Apple could probably, you know, just chug along barely doing VR. So, um, but now they're changing, they're going, well, I mean, if you look, that's the other thing, right? If you look at what Apple showed in their presentation, they show a lot of 2D, they show a lot of UI, uh, but the only 3D thing they showed was this very dingy, little dumb, like first year architecture project, like just really low poly, really low triangle count. So it's like, I wonder how many triangles they can support, you know? Um, I have a feeling it may, it may be weak. It may not be that good in 3D. Um, so we'll see. For that, you have to get the headset, do your Unity project, put a model in there, and see how it reacts, and see if the frame rate is uh, is too low. That means there's too many triangles. So, um, so with that being said, if you're aiming at Apple, well, forget about the USDZ. I think the new target is Unity. Maybe it's better to have USDZ and Unity when you're targeting uh, the Apple Display Pro. Um, so yeah, target Unity. Everything else is going to be a little bit of an edge case, or uh, you know, part of that really boring technical optimization. Which you know, do you want to be a technician or do you want to be an artist? And if you're able to get grants, then work with a technician. Of course, you, you know, you you have to have some knowledge of uh, the tech aspect, but you don't want to be 90% technician, 10% artist. Who are some of the most interesting AR artists right now? Uh, definitely Oreo Harvey, probably the classic. Uh, she has such a mastery of AR and internet art, and then the physical aspect, and you know, even living in Rome or you know, these places where there's these old museums like. There's just this love of the past and this understanding of the future and the merging between both. So I'd say um, it's one of the most exciting. But generally, there's not a lot happening in AR art because people are making these kind of mediocre AR apps. And then what they're getting from the cell phone recording is not good enough. So they will do post-processing. They will fake it to make it look good on YouTube, but it's not what people are actually seeing. It looks good on the video, it's terrible in real life. So, and then you're limited to like, what, one model? You're limited to maybe 25,000 triangles, 50,000, maybe 150,000, I don't really know on a cell phone, I think so. That would be pretty limit. Um, and even then it's gonna be chugging along barely. Um, Aurea Harvey, yeah. I believe this is how she spells her name. And um, so, so yeah, there's a lot of faking right now happening in AR. There's a lot of post-production. Um, I don't think there's a lot of artists working with the HoloLens, with the Magic Leap. Because the thing with those headsets is you're not tethered. You're, you're using the tiny little computer that's in there, which 
you know, is better than a cell phone, but it's tiny. Like, you know, a graphic card is like this. A graphic card is like this thick. So it's no match. Like, this is no match for a computer that is chunky. So, um, so with that being said, for me, one of the big resentment has been the lack of a headset that can tether to a computer. So the Magic 3, uh, the Quest 3 may be the solution to that, where potentially you can tether to your computer. And once again, just to get back into tethering, if I'm calculating from the headset, I'm going to have a limit of, let's say, 50 to maybe half a million draw triangles. Whereas if I'm on my computer, then we're looking at maybe three to five million triangles. So that's when I can create a metaverse gallery. That's when I can show 10, 15 pieces, moving stuff, animated, you know, video games, basically. Uh, whereas otherwise, you kind of feel like you're traveling to, you know, GTA 2 or like these old 90s, 2000s video game, like PlayStation 2 aesthetics kind of thing. So. Um, so yeah, I kind of got lost in a ramble there, but um, I think we haven't really seen the AR artists. And I think next year, the door is opening, and people that want to do serious stuff are going to be able to, and the public and the hardware, especially the hardware, I mean, you can't do AR without the hardware. The hardware is going to be able to receive that finally, I think. If I'm extremely wrong, it'll be a year or two after. But it, I think Meta is not going to mess it up this time. Um, and so, yeah, it's a blank page a little bit. And I'm sure, th I'm sure if you know, there's probably somebody that's more up to date. That's like Sam. You missed these like ten amazing AR artists. But I think historically speaking, we're going to be looking at more what's going to be happening next year. Um, so yeah, that's it for, for my, uh, rambling answers. I'm not sure if there's any questions, uh, that you have on your own. And don't hesitate to jump in the voice chat either. Yeah, welcome, Emily. And Twitter is going down <laughs> Will we even be able to read tweets on Twitter? Um, uh, I mean, I don't like it being tied to platforms. A lot of the people that do filters wish the filters just worked everywhere. They, they don't like it tied to Instagram. Like some people don't have an Instagram account, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, especially people uh, that are older collectors, etc. So mm, I think artists are hoping for uh, decentralizing these filters, getting them out of Snapchat, getting them out of Instagram. Um, it's kind of inevitable. It's just like whether it'll be in a year or 10 years or 50 years, like somebody, like the idea of the metaverse is decentralizing. Uh, or an issue I've had with an artist that we talked for a long time with um, was the idea of selling masks um as nfts or just basically monetizing it because you know it's, you're just getting paid in hype you're just getting paid in follows when you do those masks unless it's a brand deal um so there's like same thing with vr fashion like how do you monetize this it doesn't mean that the answer has to be nfts um or crypto but you want to and then let's say Instagram shuts down, right? Like let's say I buy a filter for $5 or $5,000 on Instagram. Instagram shuts down. I want to use that on my webcam. I want to use that. Like in the future, you'll be able to walk and have these AR fashion accessories. So I don't want to be like, oh, look at my open Instagram to see my fashion accessory. I want that to be open source in a way. So um I'm not sure, but yeah, Twitter, oh geez, is it even going to survive like three years? Um, seems like, and, and now it's like Blue Sky, right? Like Blue Sky is the kind of open source version of Twitter, or not open source, but like more open version of Twitter from the founder of Twitter, who basically designed it for the worst case scenario, which is kind of happening right now. So 
maybe maybe you will have some AR features on Blue Sky in the future. But yeah, no, um, is AR coming other places? Uh, I would definitely say no for Twitter because they're imploding. Um, but I think, for example, Office, Microsoft has been pushing AR a lot. Could make sense in Discord, especially where people are using a lot of video. Uh, and then it'll make sense in the real world. You know, Ray-Ban has worked with Meta to, well, it's not really AR, but you can think of real brands being like, okay, we want to support AR in regular looking glasses, um, especially as, as the technology, like, for real VR, AR, well, for real AR to arrive, it's probably going to be 10 to 20 year ride. We're at, we're at the beginning. It's going to get a lot better. And uh, it may, you know, there's even contact lenses that are touted to potentially do AR. So very scary, but I think something like the Google and the Facebooks, they're like, we want just regular glasses to do the AR and we know it's going to take 10 plus years, but you know, you're not going to like, I'm not going to make this casual, you know? Um, and so that's the other thing. If you're going to VR and AR, you're going to look like an idiot for 10 to 20 years. So just be aware of that. Uh, you know, you're going to have lots of pictures of you in these ridiculous headsets. And you, when you're, when you're wearing a headset in a room of normal people, especially if it's a new headset, like, you're going to be the center of tension. It's going to work on, on that awkward, awkward, uh, how sure of, of yourself you are looking completely silly. So don't go in if you're too shy or too self conscious. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. There's going to be a lot of late followers, but it's. Yeah, you know, it's way more fun to play in it when it's dangerous and dirty and there's um, sticks poking out everywhere. And you're like, <laughs> uh, Because in my time zone, it's usually during work hours. But I'm sure I'll see you on uh, Twitter or Blue Sky. <laughs> Let's see. Congresso. Uh, so Amanda says that when she saw the new Apple glasses, she was transported to the movie Congresso, which is half animation. I haven't seen it, but I'll, I'll poke through uh, the, the Google to, to have a look at it. Cheers. 